Okay, so um, today I would like to switch gears a little bit. We've been talking a lot about qualitative research and qualitative research methods. And we are at the point in the class where we're shifting towards more quantitative things. So today I'm gonna to start a series of lectures on uh, designing experiments and causality and things of that sort. Um, and more or less, we're gonna be busy with this for a long while. Uh, so going in this direction. Um, there are the class today and probably to some extent next time um, is based primarily on three books. Uh, I, as usual, have posted digital versions of these chapters in our shared folder. And I strongly encourage you to read those. Um, there's a Shadish Cook and Campbell book on experimental and quasi experimental design. This is sort of the Bible on research methods, if you will. Um, and there's two HCI research methods books that are really have a very accessible presentation and discussion of experimental designs, which I will mostly cover in class, but obviously not to the extent that they can do in those books. So again, you know, please read those. But there's also going to be a lot of we're going into statistics to some extent, not so much today, but we're starting to go in that direction. So I've uh, listed here a few pointers for for stuff to read. Uh, and again, you can find all of these uh, either in our shared folder or online, otherwise, or in the, at the library. Uh, okay. So I want to start talking about causal relationships because this is primarily the reason why people design and run experiments in the first place. Um, we start, can we turn off this light? Please? Oh yeah, I, you know, I thought I had, but I, I guess I haven't. I turned off the wrong light. Do you know how to do it? Here, yeah, I could do it. No, I'm not gonna. Oh, okay. I must have turned off the little one for the you better? Yeah, thank you. Yep. Yeah, sort of. Okay. So I want to talk about causal relationships, but as a way to get into this, here's an example. Um, so I'm going to introduce a weird definition. A cause, when we say a cause, where we mean an inus condition, insufficient but non-redundant part of an unnecessary but sufficient condition. So that's a mouthful. Hongbo okay. will quiz you on this later, I'm sure. But just to make this a little bit more intuitive, so here's the idea. Let's look at the example of a match to start a forest fire. Okay. So we're going to think about whether a match is a cause or not of a forest fire. Okay, so here's the argument. Um, fires in the forest can start for a variety of reasons. You know, maybe there's a you know lightning strike, or maybe there's something else. Lots of reasons why fires can start in the forest. So a match is not a necessary condition. You know, you could start fires in different ways in a forest. Okay. Um, also, matches, even lit, don't always start forest fires. Um, you know, maybe they weren't lit for long enough, or maybe it was rainy, or you know, who knows, right? So it's also not a sufficient condition, right? It's not enough to have a match stick that's lit to start a forest fire, and also you can start forest fires in any number of ways. Okay? But a match is a part of a bigger constellation of conditions without which a fire would not result. So, you know, it's insufficient because you also need oxygen and dry leaves and dry weather and all this other kind of stuff. Um, but it has to be non-redundant for it to be a cause of the fire. Uh, it needs to add something unique besides all of those other things that are necessary. Okay, so, you know, it can't, if you take a lit matchstick to an already burning forest, you know, that doesn't really add anything. Okay. 
So that's the idea. This is again, let me show you this module uh, definition here an insufficient but non redundant part of an unnecessary but sufficient condition. So think about this more. Uh, hopefully, the example of the match illustrates this. Okay, so that's that's what we mean when we mean a cause for something. Let me go back. Now, when we talk about an effect, we have to reason about the counter, counterfactual. Have you heard this term before? Counterfactual. So here's the idea. Um, when we talk about a counterfactual, we talk about what would have happened to the very same subjects had the cause not been present. What would have happened to the forest had the you know, uh, lit matchstick not been present. Um, okay. And notice how we can observe what happened, say, when people receive some treatment or they're subjected to some intervention, but we really cannot observe what would have happened to the very same people if simultaneously they would have not received the treatment or the intervention, which is in fact the counterfactual. So it's called that the contrary to fact, counterfactual, contrary to the fact that was observed, observed, you know, the people receiving a treatment or being subjected to some intervention. Contrary to that, we would want to know what would have happened to those same people if at the very same moment they would have not been subjected to that treatment. Okay, so notice how uh, the second one is not actually possible in this world that we live in, this physical universe, because we can't be in two, two conditions at the same time, unless in, you're in this awesome fiction series called The Man in the High Castle. I think it was on Amazon Prime, I don't know. It was on something a while ago, it was really good. Um, but really, you know, in reality, we cannot quite observe the counterfactual. Um, and when we talk about effects, we're really trying to estimate the distance between these two things, what actually happened versus what would have happened in all but the one condition that was different, which is the absence of the treatment or the intervention. Does that make sense? And is it, does it, is it clear that you can't actually observe the counterfactual? Right, because you can't have the same people that were, or you know, whatever, the same people that were subjected to some treatment or intervention, you can't have them also not be subjected to the treatment and intervention at exactly the same time they were subjected to the treatment or intervention. I see comments. Let's start here. I have a question. So on the previous slide, I think you said like it's an unnecessary cause, and I'm assuming by necessary you mean the philosophical, like the call, the effect is like two things cannot exist without each other yes um why like so i guess why is that pro that put there like why does it have to be the a non-necessary cause why do we define the cause as a unnecessary part of yeah, this sorry, yeah. bigger thing yeah um why do we do this? Because I, I, so you should read the Shady Shkun Campbell book for this discussion. I don't actually know. My limited understanding of this is that um, we do this to distinguish the two scenarios. So going back to the matchstick example, to distinguish the scenario when um, it was really the matchstick that started the forest fire versus other things that could have also started the forest fire. If we want to make these claims about really the matchstick being the cause of the forest fire, we that would be about sufficiency, though it wasn't wouldn't be about necessity. Let me think more about this. I don't I don't know. Let me think about this. Look. Um, this is on the effect side of things. Uh, so, for, I mean, in general, understand that the principle of counterfactual can't apply in 
give it to people something to instead of the same time don't have it for you. Uh -huh. uh, but something like machine learning, you can see that um, you have uh, one model, you run it on a test set, which is one person have, and another model, you run it on an absolutely identical test set, which you can't have it be matched with anything else. Um, and it spits out ridiculous. Uh, and if the second model is better than the first model, it is, except it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the strict definition of this, right? The strict definition assumes that those things happen at exactly the same time because the passing of time acts as a confounding factor. Like if you know, could change things, um, you know, that you don't observe. So strictly speaking, under this definition, it wouldn't be that, but it would be an approximation of that. Right, so and, and that's really the trick. That's all of what we will be talking about. Wait, there's more, more stuff on chat. Does a cause have to be insufficient? Suppose a match always starts a forest fire. Isn't this still a cause of the fire? Yeah, that's a good point. That's sort of a, similar to what Elijah was saying about. So let me uh, let me take this offline because I don't, I have to read Shady Cook and Campbell again and so see kind of what they're arguing. Um, why they insist on having all of these, um, you know, characteristics. Uh, I, I take the point. Both of you, I think, raised the same point. Uh, so th thanks. Okay. Um, right. So the high level point here is we can't actually observe the true counterfactual ever. We just cannot. Nobody can. Um, so we have to approximate it as best we can. And, you know, Luke, you had a good example of approximating it. So really what we're doing with experimental and quasi-experimental design and all of this observational studies and whatever else, this entire field of causal inference, et cetera, et cetera, all of this kind of stuff is just an attempt to create a high quality source of counterfactual evidence um, so that we can uh, reason about how this differs from the uh, treatment condition. And therefore, reason about the size of the and effect, the difference between them, if any. That's all of what everyone is doing. Like it's fundamentally this: it's trying to you know, create a good source of counterfactual evidence as, as best they can, because the real one is just unreal, literally. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's pause for a second. We're talking about causal relationships. Say, you know, the match and the forest fire um, and you know in, in more intuitive terms than the complicated INES definition um, what are the ingredients I think I've talked about this maybe in um, SSSG at some point or I've talked about this in other places what are conditions for or ingredients for establishing a causal relationship and I see Courtney wants to offer some yeah I just so wanted to do the easiest one first um the cause has to precede the effect. Do you agree with this? The cause has to precede the effect. You can't, so if you have a burning matchstick after the forest is already on fire, it doesn't add anything. So it can't be a cause of the forest fire. Well, I mean, unless you just used it to start the forest fire, I suppose, but uh, let's not be pedantic. No, so the cause has to precede the effect. That's one. What else? Correlation. Elaborate. The cause and effect correlated adjacently. Right. That's the second one. So the cause and the effect must be measurably correlated. You have to be able to observe that you know varying one is correlated with changes in the other. Right, there ha this has to be there. Otherwise, uh, if you if you vary one and the other one does nothing, it right, can't possibly be a cause for it. But you have to be able to observe this association between changes in one and changes in the other. That's second. That's two. What's the third one? Aiden. <clears throat> We talked about a time thing. That was Courtney over Zoom just a second ago. 
Anyways, yeah, so the cause must precede the effect. That was the first one we talked about. Oh. It has to happen before. That was time. Uh, Courtney knows, so I'm not going to call on you. Let me wait for someone else. Oh, like there's no other thing that's um that's it yes wait comments in chat no confounding factors yes okay so that's the idea that's the third one the third one is you have to exclude we call this plausible alternative explanation same effect okay if you remember nothing from today's lecture but one thing you know, this is the thing to remember i cannot emphasize this enough this will serve you throughout the rest of your careers. It's an invaluable bit nugget of useful information. Right? There are three ingredients to establishing a causal relationship. A cause must precede the effect. They have to be correlated. And you have to exclude plausible alternative explanations for that effect other than the cause. That makes sense. So this was the part, I guess, about you know, it, it if it's already on fire and whatnot, he doesn't add anything to it. As the force is already on fire, the match doesn't add anything to that. Do you agree with this? Wouldn't we sort of get the second one and the third one in that if we assume that we're only finding a plausible explanation, it would have to be related to the effect, or am I just like digging way too deep into the room? Say that again. Like, if you can't find any plausible alternative explanation, um, I guess that doesn't assume that the explanation you do have is one that is plausible. Realizable. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 How, how do you prove there is no other plausible explanation? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Right? You must skip everything else. So, I mean, so no, seriously, so that's that's this, like that's what everybody is after, right? It's proving the unprovable. That's what the you know entire fields of research and science are dedicated to. People in econometrics do this for a living. The machine learning causal inference people do this for a living. You know, there's tons and tons of people that literally do this their entire lives. They try to figure out ways to make this more and more robust, right, and and trustworthy. That's the question. It's really hard. There's no free lunch, except there is. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> okay. So remember this. If you remember nothing else, you have to remember this. So now, why am I insisting? Because you'll often see in papers, I can't tell you how many times I've been annoyed by this, especially when I read papers at 10 p.m. and I'm tired. Um, like people making causal claims in papers that, that do not you know, offer these three properties or some of these three properties, right? Uh, or you know, when you see them in the news or whatever, uh, you know, people making all kinds of claims that you know, X results in Y without actually offering you evidence for these three ingredients. Uh, so, I guess the side effect of this is you will now be perpetually grumpy like I am because you will always be upset with the absence of you know, sufficiently robust evidence for these. Um, okay, so this is just a way of illustrating the same idea, right? There's a cause and an effect. The cause causes the effect and you're excluding alternative causes for that effect. Um, okay, so this was a lecture well, intended to be a lecture on experimental design. That's the kind of thing that people do in medicine primarily, but also in all, you know, all kinds of other fields. Um, when I talk about experimental design, I talk about these randomized control trials that you hear uh, a lot about in you know, medicine and whatever else, the kinds of things that uh, people use to test new drugs and vaccines and all kinds of things like that. Why do I say this? Why do I say that, uh, say, a randomized control trial is a really good method for establishing causal relationships? 
so you know how this works so you know so there's some people that i don't know are given uh, the vaccine and some people that aren't given the vaccine and i don't know you test how uh, much better or healthier or whatever you know the people in the treatment group are compared to the ones in the control group right that's sort of the idea why does that work i'm going to put these up again someone we haven't heard from yet why does that work why does a randomized control trial like that work oh i have a question so before we talk we can apply to the same person um for example a trial and have it on the trial and not trial at the same time right but can we minimize that for class by trying to have people that have at least more or less the same characteristics that's the idea and but it's it's never the true thing it's always an approximation yes yeah so the, the whole point is we will dedicate the rest of more or less this semester talking about ways to, to approximate that when we can't actually get it which is always we can never actually get it yeah so i agree that's that's what we're going to be talking about for a long while so just hang in there so back to this why do these control trials work why are they such a good design for establishing causal relationships let's say the vaccine let's talk about the vaccine as an example elijah provided that randomization is effective we are kind of in uh ensuring that the two groups are comparable to one another that they don't have other confounding characteristics that may be causing any outcome user yeah so that's really that's we're, we're talking about part three here so let, let me, let's walk through the, all, all of them um part one the uh i don't know vaccine precedes the improvement in health by design because whatever you're the one administering it right so you, you give the vaccine to people before you measure their health or whatever right so it's this is by design uh two uh there's some correlation between them yes you measure health outcomes right and you know you there is or there isn't you observe it right and three that's the hardest always the hardest one three you get this through this magic of randomization because you know if the groups are large enough they should be similar enough on average in terms of all the other possible causes for their improvement or uh, whatever decrease in health that makes sense right because you know may maybe elderly people are, are at higher risk so you know you know whatever they, they would have poor health outcomes on average Right, but but because you randomly assign people to conditions, there will be roughly as many old people in each group. So that can't be the reason why the treatment group get, people get better at a higher rate, because there will be about as many you know elderly and about as many you know of anything. Right, if you've done this right, there'll be about as many of anything in either group. All right, so this is why people have been doing this for centuries now, so following this. Uh, you know, randomized control trial as the gold standard for science in general in all disciplines, not just ours. And because it sort of, you know, very naturally fits uh, the, this list of requirements for establishing causal relationships. Okay. Okay. Um, quick aside. So we. Um, this is an important definition to remember. I bet Hongbo is going to ask you about this on the quiz. If only he would be here to remember to do that. Um, between mediators and moderators, you will hear these terms used a lot. Um, so people often confuse them. So I just want to make sure you know what they mean. So when we talk about a causal relationship, uh, it's usually say between an independent variable X that causes some dependent variable y we call those independent and dependent like y depends on x but x is a causal 
has a causal relationship with Y. Um, so mediators are links in this explanatory chain. That's what we mean by a mediator. Right, so, you know, the causal relationship for X as a causal explanation for Y could flow through M, if you will, as well. But to give an example, you know, let's say we're talking about socioeconomic status as a cause for reading ability in children. Sure, you know, it is, but it's mediated probably by, you know, lots of things, including the uh, education level of the parents. All right, so look how, you know, say socioeconomic status probably causes higher education levels in parents on average. And look how higher education levels in parents on average probably cause, you know, more books at home and more encouragement for children to read. Okay, so, um, you know, it's it's not just that the socioeconomic status of the child, right, causes their reading ability, but it, you know that's mediated by you know all these other pathways, of which this is just one example. I'm sure there are others. Does that make sense? That's a mediator. You should... uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you. Okay. Um, the other one is the moderator. Okay. So a moderator, when, let's say that we have this variable, we call that a moderator. If the strength of this causal relationship between X and Y varies as this moderator variable varies. Make sense? So let me give you an example. So let's say there's a causal relationship between the amount of experience professional experience somebody has and their salary, right? More senior people uh, make more money typically, okay? Um, so gender is a possible moderator of that relationship, right? Because we know that, you know, for every dollar that say men make on average, women make, I don't know, 78 cents. Okay, so the strength of the relationship between seniority and salary varies with gender and okay? therefore gender is a moderator variable in this relationship right it changes the strength of this relationship yes um let me go to jenny and then sam on chat this might be somewhat unrelated, but I know that there's this idea of like statistical causal um, inference, I think, versus like what we talked about sort of earlier of like like correlation or linear modeling. And I remember, I don't remember the piece like the statistics behind causal inference, but I think it looked like something like the media is a moderator. That's kind of curious if you could maybe um, explain the ideas behind, I don't know, it's too much of a tangent because there's not if that's the case, but between like causal inference. Probably too much of a tangent, but the short is um, this is cleaner and closer. Well, not this. We're talking about experiments, sort of in the, in the randomized trial sense. Um, that's cleaner and closer because it allows you to directly test that causal relationship because you, the researcher, are the one manipulating the treatment or the intervention. All of what causal inference does is try to achieve as much of this as possible, as much of the confidence in, in these relationships as possible without actually having the ability to manipulate, right? The treatment, but you know, doing it from observations or through other means. So the idea is, you know, you, you, again, you always try to get as close as possible to this gold standard, right? But sometimes you can't run, you know, trials or it's expensive or just not practical. Right, so you do all kinds of other things or which we will be doing some more or less the rest of the semester. Yeah. Uh, and now back to Sam. Sam says, I don't quite understand this graph. Sam, which, which graph? So, so, okay, socioeconomic and parent. Back. Uh, here. 
is there a difference between the socioeconomic status of the parents while they were still children, which has a causal influence on their education level as adults, versus the socioeconomic status of those parents' children later in time? Sam, that's a lot to parse. Um, I don't suppose you could just speak, could you? Oh yeah, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Um, right, so I guess I was looking at this graph and I was like, okay, so the socioeconomic economic status, uh, like is a causal factor in the parent's education level, okay. And I was like, well, when we say socioeconomic status on the left, are we talking about the socioeconomic status of the child? Right, like well, let's say the family as a whole. Right, so as of the family as a whole, like, but at the time that we're measuring their reading ability, right, or like at, at what point in time? I I don't think it matters for this example. I think it holds at any point in time, right? So like, pick the one that makes most sense to you. You know, because uh, people that come from wealthier backgrounds will, you know, pass on some of that to their children, right? So, you know, their kids will be wealthier off and so on. So it sort of, you know, it goes across generations. Yeah, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So if you're saying like, but I guess I think like, if, you, if you're saying, okay, it's the socioeconomic, and socioeconomic status of the child at the time we measure their reading ability, then that can't, like, that can't have a causal influence on the parent's education level because the parents were educated at an earlier point in time, right? Yeah, yeah. So you know, of the family as a whole, right? Of the environment the child the child was growing up in. Right, but even then, like, let's say that the parents finished their higher, like, finished their education before they had children, then we still can't be talking about the socioeconomic status of the family as a whole. We would have to be talking about it at some point before that family was even formed. Maybe I agree. I agree with that, but I, I'm simplifying a little bit here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. No. That I agree with that. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for the comment. Okay, any more on this? All right, so mediators versus moderators. Um, you probably have heard this a million times that correlation by itself is not enough. Just a few cute examples to remind you. Uh, right, the correlation does not, by construction fundamentally, does not give you any information about which of the variables came first uh, and also, no information about alternative plausible explanations. So it only satisfies one of the three requirements for a causal relationship, right? That's you know therefore insufficient. Um, so you know, here, you know, did, if there's a high correlation between income and education, you know, did high income cause people to get more education? Did more educated people end up having higher income? You know, which way does the causality flow? Probably both ways, um, but in any case, you know, it's not clear by just observing a correlation, which of the two it is, right? Uh, because of all these other confounding variables. Uh, and you've seen lots of these, I'm sure. There's an entire website dedicated to acute you know, graphs like these. Uh, here is the number of people who drown by falling into a pool over time, uh, correlated with the number of films that Nicolas Cage appeared in. Uh, perfectly correlated almost. Here is the total revenue generated by arcades versus the number of PhDs in computer science awarded in the United States, you know, et cetera. You can find, uh, you know, you can spend hours you know, reading similar examples. There are many. Uh, okay. So experiments, we said this was a lecture about experiments after all. So we said we like experiments. Um, some reasons why we, might not be able to or want to do experiments. One, the conditions might just be unrealistic. It might be hard uh, to design an actual experiment where you can manipulate things uh, in unrealistic conditions, or it might be super expensive. Uh, two, they tell you nothing about the mechanism, about the high and the why the effects occurred. They are really great at establishing that there is a causal relationship, but you know, sadly, they cannot tell you what the underlying mechanism behind that causal relationship is. 
I am sure I have given you this example before because I've given it to in, in other uh, situations. So I'll be very brief, but you know, remember the story of how they discovered uh, that uh, if you eat oranges, you can recover from scurvy back in the 1700s. Right? They didn't know why. They established this causal relationship between oranges or citrus fruit and scurvy, but they didn't understand the underlying mechanism, which is this vitamin C deficiency and all of the biology related to that. Right? They knew that oranges cause uh, scurvy cures, if you will, but they didn't understand why until about a hundred years later. Okay, so these are two separate things. We can confidently establish that there is a causal relationship between things, even without necessarily knowing why it happens and what is the underlying mechanism for that. Um, this brings me back slightly to the theory rant from earlier in the semester where I talked about you know, various flavors, various kinds of theory, and how the coolest theories are the ones that actually describe also the mechanism, right? The ones that go deeper and describe the, the causal mechanisms, not just uh, describe the phenomenon. Okay. Uh, Right, and we talked about this unique advantages. You can confidently establish these causal relationships. Okay, um, let's talk about some terms here when we talk about experiments. So in general, when you hear the term experiment, people refer to some study in which uh, an intervention or treatment, I'm gonna be using the two interchangeably, is deliberately introduced to observe its effects by the researchers. Okay, so uh, generally speaking, that is an experiment. Um, a randomized experiment or a true experiment is the one we've been talking about and it's the one you're most familiar with, right? This is the one in which units are assigned to receive the treatment or not by some random process. Okay, so actually, you know, the, the, when I say experiment, and I, the first thing that comes to mind is this kind of experiment, the one that involves randomization, not the more general term. There's also a term called quasi-experiment, almost experiment, quasi-experiment, uh, that, that is, you know, basically that, except there's no random assignment, right? Because probably you couldn't, it was just not practical. So, you know, they did the next best thing. They compared these conditions or outcomes in, in different conditions, even if they weren't able to do the assignments themselves randomly. Um, a natural experiment is when the cause cannot be manipulated, but it's something that occurred in nature, like the plague. Okay, we could study the effects of the plague on, I don't know, working from home or whatever, like these kind of things. I mean, I mean the pandemic, um, right? So that's something that happened naturally or a hurricane or, you know, whatever else, right? It's not that the researchers introduced a pandemic, unless you're a conspiracy theorist um, or a hurricane or what have you, right? These are so naturally occurring phenomena, uh, but they could still be used uh, as part of an experimental design, um, or a correlational study or an observational study. This is the kind of study that you know, does not manipulate anything, but tries to make inferences from data uh, recorded somehow, pre-existing somehow, okay, without any kind of manipulation. Uh, yeah, so you, you know, you've seen lots of examples of experiments in the news. We are all part of this great experiment over the last few years, uh, et cetera. Okay, now we talked about this a little bit. We talked about the true experiments, randomized experiments, control versus treatment. Uh, we talked about this. Uh, okay, so here is a flow chart, you know, to know if you're really doing an experiment, right? So do you have, first of all, do you have multiple groups or conditions? Uh, if you don't, then it's not an experiment. If you do, is there randomization used somewhere in the assignments? 
If it is, it's probably a true experiment. If it isn't, it's probably not. It's probably a, a quasi experiment or something else. So that's a uh, easy flowchart to know if you're really doing an experiment. Okay, let's talk about some designs that are used with random assignment. The most basic one is the following. So here, uh, I'm going to be using this notation. So um, the R denotes random assignment of participants to conditions. Each row is a group of participants. So here we have two groups, the top row and the bottom row, two groups of participants. Uh, they were randomly assigned to conditions. In the first group, they received a treatment or an intervention. That's the X mark. Okay. In the second group, they did not. That make sense? Um, and there we go. Uh, and we measure their outcomes after uh, the treatment, right? And then we compare them. That's the idea. So this is a notation for representing this design. This is the most basic design uh, we've been talking about, okay? So one limitation of this is that we can't really separate the active ingredients in the treatment or the intervention from the mere experience of being treated. You see this? Right, the second group here, the control group received no treatment. The first group received your treatment. Okay, maybe they got better, but we don't know if they got better, but we have not excluded one possible alternative explanation, which is that any treatment would have made them better, not just your treatment. So it could be that your treatment caused them to get better, but it could be that literally any other treatment would have had the same effect. Just treating them with anything would have had the same effect. Right? So this design by itself is insufficient to distinguish between those two scenarios. Does that make sense? You see this? How do we fix it? Well, I, I was thinking that one case is you introduce another, or I'm assuming with that where you just choose a random unrelated intervention, but then also choose that. that. Yeah, that's the idea. So we fix it by, um, so you know, we can fix it in two ways. We could fix it, for example, by treating everybody, treating both groups. You know, you treat one group with the actual treatment and you treat the other group with a placebo or whatever else. So that's what you see represented here. Both groups receive some treatment, okay? Um, or you could simply introduce a third group that does not get treated at all as a, as a baseline condition, right? So, this, this one would allow you to separate the effects of any treatment, right? The fact of just being treated in the first place from the effects of the treatments themselves. Okay. Okay, one question here, Elijah. I was gonna say by effective treatment here, you mean like, as in the fact that the person feels that they're being treated, like the placebo effect essentially, or what, what do you? I, I, I don't know what you're measuring, right? So that varies you know, between studies. I don't know what the relevant outcome measures are, uh, but I'm assuming something, uh, oh, oh, you mean, you mean when, uh, when I say that the, the mere uh, receiving of any treatment yeah. could cause them to get better. Right, right. So they could just, you know, feel uh, the, a placebo effect for, for having received an injection. Yeah. Uh, and they will just you know, feel happy and euphoric and will feel better because of that, not because of the active ingredients in the, the vaccine say. Right. Yeah, that's fine. Right. So like we're trying to separate those. We want to separate, you know, the placebo euphoria from the actual active ingredients. Yes, thank you. Eli. Part of what you're testing is the presence of the treatment itself in having an effect. In that case, would the basic example be sufficient? Like, for example, 
if you were to say design a smart reply suggestion algorithm for Gmail and you don't really necessarily care like if the algorithm itself is super great but you care if the algorithm together with the presence of the system itself has an effect yeah so you yeah the distinction is using for example the distinction is between uh, testing whether a smart or a dumb reply algorithm would have an effect literally any algorithm would have an effect versus versus a smart effect smart reply algorithm whether that would have a stronger more useful whatever better effect than a dumb reply algorithm uh, and maybe better still or indistinguishable from a no reply uh, no, no reply algorithm or you know maybe you make it worse if it's dumb right maybe you were better off not having any right so but the point is you could separate between these three scenarios right having no smart reply at all so having no reply at all, algorithm at all right? having a dumb one and having a, a smart one presumably uh, so you can't do all three with the first design you need one of the you need the, the latter one for that okay um, the other thing I noticed here is that with this design, where both groups get a treatment, um, if you don't know, you know, if you're not observing an effect, you don't know if because both equally effective or both were equally ineffective. Uh, you don't know if they both worked as well. I mean, you know that they're indistinguishable, but they both could have been very good or they both could have been very bad. For you, those are different scenarios you want to distinguish them you can't right with just the middle uh, design right so again you need the third one for this um, okay so a common limitation still with this third one is the lack of pretest meaning you know note how we test people on these different outcomes after the treatment right at the end of the experiment we have no testing of any of this before we administer the treatment we rely on the magic of random assignments right to ensure to trust that these groups are otherwise indistinguishable so that's okay in, in principle in practice it could backfire right because you know a maybe your groups are too small right so maybe randomization even if implemented correctly you know did not get rid of all of these confounders uh, and b especially if there's something like attrition you know people dropping out mid study right more so in one group than the other that would change the composition of these groups um, so it's useful to also test them pre-treatment if you can Does that make sense but if for no if for no other reason, but at least to convince yourselves that the random assignment worked and that the groups are indistinguishable on all of these other variables that are important. Uh, but certainly, if you're dealing with attrition uh, during the study, that's also useful. Uh, okay. Uh, and then there's a few more advanced designs. So I want to focus on these next. It's going to get extra interesting so here's another way to think about designs whether or not you're testing more than one independent variable as a branching point if you aren't we are on the left hand side here and we're talking about the basic design if we are we're talking about this factorial design or you're testing multiple variables at the same time Um, and then, depending on how many conditions you have, you get to decide between a between subject design or within subject design. So let me let me elaborate on this. So between group or between subjects design is one in which every participant is only exposed to one experimental condition. Okay, it's called between subjects because it's different subjects or groups of subjects exposed to the different experimental conditions. Right? So you're comparing 
effects between subjects because it's always different ones. So for example, let's say your task is to type a 500 word document using uh, one of three possible keyboard, keyboard layouts, right? The traditional QWERTY layout, layout uh, the Dvorak keyboard layout, which is the one you see uh, on the left hand side in this bottom image, or an alphabetic keyboard layout where the keys are just laid out alphabetically. I don't know if you know this, by the way. So the, the Dvorak keyboard came out in like, I don't know, the 20s or the 30s, 1920s or 30s, about 100 years ago. Um, and it is demonstrably more effective at typing than all of the keyboards we're using because uh, keys that are more often used together are placed closer physically on the keyboard. So it's just your hands and fingers have to travel less you know, when you're typing to find these keys. Uh, but somehow it never took off because the other one had already been in existence and had been popular and you know, just impossible to overcome this initial you know, inertia of being dominant on the market. Uh, but you know, there is an alternative keyboard layout that is demonstrably more effective. Okay, so let's say let's say you were to uh, design an experiment, right, to study this. You could uh, randomly assign your participants to one of these three conditions, and in each condition, you know, they get to type, I don't know, one document or a bunch of documents using one of these keyboards. Okay, that makes sense. So that's between subjects. The alternative is within subjects. So here, every participant is exposed to multiple experimental conditions, right? So instead of having, uh, you know, different students use different keyboards to type documents, I could ask each one of you to type different documents using different keyboards. Okay? Each one of you would be exposed to different conditions. You would be typing documents using different keyboards, right? And it would always be, you know, the same person in these different conditions. Okay, that's the idea. That makes sense. So you could see, you know, kind of how I could test this, you know, design of these keyboards in in one of these two ways. Okay. So, yeah, let's think about it. What, when, and why? Should, you know, would you do one or the other? Like, what's the advantage of one versus the other? What am I gaining? What am I losing, if anything, in, in the different designs? If the population you're studying is very difficult to recruit from, and within subjects doesn't provide like a significant threat to validity in your particular scenario with the attrition, then that would be the advantage. Please elaborate. Like, um, I guess if we were to study, um, for some reason, I guess this is talking about a specific example um, of the like treatment, which I don't have. So we're um, talking. I, I'm talking specifically about this keyboard uh, touching gotcha. example. Gotcha. Um, I mean, we could do it in general, but I mean, we have a concrete example, so might as well stick, try to stick to it. Wait, tell me what you would consider, right, when deciding between these, like what things come to your mind. Let's, Jenny. Um, I think it, maybe I'm wrong, but I think it depends on the research questions, right? Like I could see a case where if you wanted to know how many keyboard is perhaps like most effective typing speed yeah typing speed. typing speed that's the research question gotcha because i guess i was just thinking about in, in terms of like isolation effects right there's definitely a case where you might have um depending on how people were introduced to each treatment each one may be impacting another that that would be one thing that's going through my head from uh -huh. um the within subjects design i think um versus like between i would say i would be much more confident in the result because i know that there's at least 
it's not many external factors other than maybe prior experience that might be impacting it, which I would need to account for. Um, so I think those are cool. Okay, yeah. What else? Look. For with the subjects like sort of the education that I guess advantage of this research um, is uh, depending on the treatment on um, the ordering of uh, how you apply the treatments to the within to the subjects with whom subjects come out. So it, especially for technical speech, if you have the technical speech doctor in the case, uh, then uh, by the time they get to the second or third trial, but second or third people are familiar with the doctor, they get memorized sequence the test. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this is a really good point, and I want you to remember this. Uh, it, it, this is a major consideration when you're choosing designs. Um, is these order effects? I'm going to talk more about this in a second. Right. So in the between subjects design, it is always different people. So no subject is exposed to multiple conditions. Right? Every subject is exposed to only one condition. The within subject subject designs, it's the same subject being exposed to multiple conditions. So that means, you know, a it means it might take longer, right? Because now you know instead of recruiting twice as many of you or three times as many of you, I you know ask each one of you to do three documents instead of one, right? Because I want to test you in each of these conditions. But it might get longer. Um, you're also probably you know learning something getting better at the task whatever you know you could argue that by doing the first one right so that would have an impact on how would you do on the second one would have an impact on how would you do on the third one etc because i'm testing you repeatedly right so because i'm exposing you to you know multiple treatments multiple conditions right there's stuff that can happen there right that we have to account for somehow right? so that's a big consideration at the same time it came up in this discussion just now um I would need, you know, three times as many of you, right, to get the same number of observations with a between subjects design compared to a within subjects design, right? So it's probably a lot harder for me to recruit and run the study uh, between subjects because I need more of you, right? Because you know, each one of you only does one condition instead of three conditions. Right, so I would have overall fewer observations if I don't recruit more of you. Does that make sense? I was going to say, if, if you need to do deception at all, then that's not going to work within groups because you can't <laughs> undeceive yeah. them or yeah, re deceive them. Yeah, yeah. So that's another example, right? Some, some kinds of questions just cannot be done within subjects. So you, must, you are forced to do them between subjects give you another example maybe you want to study uh, we talked about this copilot uh, ai that uh, writes code for you uh, maybe you want to study oh it affects the productivity of novices and experts or something. do that within subjects because one subject cannot both be simultaneously a novice and an expert you would have to do this between subjects it's just not possible for you know the subject to satisfy both of these conditions at the same time um, so, you know, there are lots of these examples where you just cannot add subjects. Uh, okay, so here's, here's more on this. I've got to cover this. So there's two kinds of order effects. Um, one is learning. Learning effects uh, happen when uh, you get better over time at those tasks. So, therefore, you know, the conditions that you complete towards the end of the experiment are expected to show better performance than the ones at the beginning of the experiment because you're learning over time as you're doing these tasks. So, for example, with the three keyboards, you'll just naturally get better at typing over time, you know, even if it's the different keyboards. And, you know, the more you type, the better you get at typing in general. And, you know, there's obviously variation probably uh, between keyboards, but you just get better at typing, period. Uh, there'll be learning. Uh, the opposite of this would be fatigue, right? So like, the more I ask of you to do in an experiment, you will get tired. So the poorer you'll do on the latter things. You know, think of class. Let's say I have your you know, undivided attention in minute one, right? As we get towards minute 80, I have decreasingly less of your, more of your attention, right? 
I have less of your attention over time right, towards the end of the class. Because you get tired, I get tired. Right, so the same in an experiment. Um, so you can see how you know the order of the tasks here can cause both of these effects and they're in opposite directions. Right, so then you know it's a question of which one is more significant, right? And which way would it bias your your up results? Uh, so you know, just based on order effects, the between subjects design would win, right? Because there is no order. Uh, everybody gets one treatment, so that's just you know a better design, right? Uh, no learning, no learning effects, and it would take less to compete the experiment overall. So less of this fatigue and frustration, etc. Um, at the same time, okay, um, you could have really huge differences between so individuals in a between subjects design that could obscure the actual effects you're uh, studying. You know, unless you have like really huge groups, right? When uh, which is harder, right? You need you know tons and tons of people, right, to be really confident that the individual differences wash out in the aggregate, right? Otherwise, if you have relatively small people, which is what happens in practice because it's complicated to run experiments, right? You're always threatened by you know like how much would you know individual differences in I don't know programming skill or whatever affect your uh, experience using Copilot or something. Does that make sense? Um, so you would probably prefer uh, a within subjects design, right? If you're worried about individual differences. The more complex and cognitively difficult the tasks are, the more these individual differences will start to matter. If it's something you know super simple and repetitive, it probably won't matter too much. If it's something complex that requires a lot of thought, etc will probably have a huge impact on performance. Um, so you know, you'd prefer, in that case, you would prefer within subject design because it's still the same you between conditions, right? But you know, it won't matter anymore how good you are at programming in general because it's still the same you between conditions. It's the same you with and without copilot, say. So you know, it, it, would, be, it would be irrelevant how much expertise you have in programming in, in, the, in the setting. Uh, and we talked about this other issue, which is the number of participants you would need to get the same number of observations. Like right? would be a lot higher in a between subjects design. And you know, that just might be prohibitive. You might not be able to recruit as many people. Okay. Um, all right, so this is sort of the same, uh, it's a summary of the same discussion we had. So now I want to dive a little bit deeper into it. It seems like within subject designs are super common and useful, but we still have this issue of order effects, you know, learning or fatigue or what have you. I'm going to call these order effects more generally, right? So now the question that I'm opening is, you know, can we do anything about those while still keeping this otherwise attractive within subject design? And so let's talk about that for a few minutes. So the way to uh, compensate for an order effect is counterbalancing. That is dividing your participants into subgroups within each condition and uh, changing the order in which they you're administering the conditions for each group. So let me be more specific. Um, let's say, you know, the simplest case, you know, let's say you have a factor with two levels, uh, A and B. Okay. So here you want to your participants in two groups. And the first group gets to do um, the first group is tested first on condition A and then on condition B. The second group is tested in the opposite order. So let's say you know group one gets tested you know, with copilot first and without copilot second, right? Group two is tested in the reverse order. 
that makes sense? So why is this a good idea? Look. If you randomly assign to each group, you get the, the same random um, uh, effect uh, as you did before. So on average, uh, if there's an advantage to doing it in one order, then the other group Right. So at the end, if I if, if I average across these groups, you know whatever uh, you know benefit the first group gets by doing it in the A B order, you know the other people should reverse that, right? The second group should reverse that benefit because they do it in the opposite order, right? So you know whatever is left should really be, uh, you know, the size of the effect of you know A versus B rather than the order in which I expose them to A or B. I see skepticism. I guess, is this something that is assuming like a, a positive effect for one ordering and a negative effect for the other ordering? Yes, I'm assuming that, well, positive or negative. I'm assuming that whatever you know, order effect there is, Going from A to B, I can get the opposite going from B to A. Yeah, I am fundamentally assuming that. And I don't know if it's positive or negative. I just, I am assuming that it's, it's the opposite if I change the order, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. Does that make sense? So, yes. Okay, so this is called a Latin square. Uh, for reasons that you have to ask uh, Euler about, the Swiss mathematician. Uh, it's a very common design though. So it turns out there are Latin squares of, of any size. So the one we talked about was the two by two. Uh, that was the one here. You know, two groups, you use two groups, two conditions, you change the order. Uh, there's a three by three, you know, A, B, C, B, C, A, C, A, B. So note how uh, every condition appears once on every row and once on every column. That's a way to construct these lambda squares, uh, et cetera. You could do this for arbitrary sizes. They can be larger, right? If you have more uh, conditions, okay? So the idea is to try to cancel out these order effects, right? By subdividing your participants in these different groups and exposing them to the conditions and, and opposing orders. Yes? Okay. Um, so here's an example. Let's say you want to determine if three editing methods, we're going to call them A and C, differ in the time required for common editing tasks. Uh, so A is you're just using arrow keys and the backspace key uh, and you're typing. The B method is you're searching and replacing using some dialog and C method is, I don't know, point and double click with a mouse or something and then you're typing in that location for editing. It doesn't really matter what they are. So there's three uh, editing methods and you wanna test out uh, which one is most effective, right? Which one gets people to edit faster text right, as a way of interaction. Okay, so you have 12 participants and to counterbalance the learning effects, you divide them in three groups, like we just talked about, right? You follow this Latin square design, the three by three. Um, and, you know, each participant say there's five tasks uh, with one editing method and, they, and then they do another five tasks with the second editing method, and then they do another five tasks with the third editing method, and you average out the, you know, I don't know, the time it took them to do the, uh, the different tasks. So it, I could have just had one task here, uh, but maybe I want to have more observations. So I asked them to do you know, multiple tasks of the same nature within each of these groups, okay? Uh, so let's say, so here's what some of the data that you get back could look like. Uh, these are the three different groups we talked about, right? So first group does ABC in that order. Second group does BCA. Third group does CAB, right? So we're following the Latin square, the design. Um, and 
uh, you have the 12 participants on the uh, rows here, and you're recording the time it took them to do those edits or something in each of these uh, conditions. Or rather, the mean time across the five, I don't know, documents they edited or something. Okay. So I want to point you to a couple of things here. So first of all, so then you look at the, um, you know, the mean across these, diff these three different conditions, A, B, and C, and you conclude that the third condition, whatever that was, the mouse and whatever else, the third condition, uh, in that third condition, people spent the less time you know, figuring out where to edit and doing the actual edit, and therefore that's the winning condition. Right? That's the one with the, the lowest time, the fastest speed, you know, that's the one you're happy about. Okay? So that's your conclusion. Um, and you know, maybe the other two are uh, you know, about the same, like one is slightly faster, one is slightly slower. You know, we're, we could talk about statistically significant differences between these, maybe, you know, maybe not. Uh, maybe there aren't any, in any case, the third one seems to be faster, so you're happy with that, okay? So that's sort of the, the workflow you're following uh, for your analysis. The other thing to note here is, and this is really important, um, is that the counterbalancing worked because the overall mean uh, for each of the groups is about the same. And again, we're not talking about statistically significant differences and all that. You know, we could do that separately. Uh, but you can observe that it's about the same, right? So, um, sure, you know, at the individual task level, you would probably observe these differences, these learning effects. But overall, across the three groups, you see that they cancel uh, each other out. Okay. So, whatever benefit they gain by doing ABC, you know, it cancels out with doing BCA and, and, and CAB respectively. Okay. All right. So now that's all great. So that, you know, that, that was a success story. Um, but now I want to challenge you a little bit. So going back to say this three by three example, I'm claiming there's still something wrong with this. What is wrong with this? Okay, I'm going to make it bigger. Someone that we haven't heard from. What is still wrong with, with this? Eli. You never test in reverse order? Um, you do, sometimes you do. You never do B, C, D, A. I guess you do DC in the last row in some sense. You do C after D. But I guess you're you're going in a good direction. I guess um, sort of generalizing that uh, do Latin squares test a certain number of permutations, but they don't test every permutation. Um, so of course the number of permutations just explodes and increase the number of things. Um, it's whatever the number of things is factorial. Uh, so or, Right, so an effect of this, or side effect of this, is that um, some um, orders are tested more than others. So I've highlighted just as an example, the AB order, right? You get A, B, A preceding B uh, three times at least, if I'm not counting the middle one, right? So you get, you get the AB order once, twice, three times. You don't get the BA order, right? So this is, I think your point as well, that you know, some of these orders get tested a lot more than others. And okay? so does it matter?
what was the fundamental assumption that you called me out on a minute ago? That um, the effects cancel out. That the effects cancel out. So what if they don't? Let me show you an example on Thursday. I don't want to keep you too long. 